Um, how many people have uh, heard of Jabel? Yeah, not you guys in the back. <laughs> I know you guys. Uh, that's that's good because uh, um, most people uh, in the conferences that I speak to have never heard of our company. Um, I like to say that we're the uh, we're the only twenty billion dollar company that uh, that people haven't heard of, uh, and 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 that's actually for good reason. Uh, one is we didn't hire a, you know we're a fifty year old company. We didn't hire our first uh, you know head of marketing until three years ago, so uh, you know we didn't believe in uh, um, in promoting the company in large part because we make products for the world's best brands, and uh, you know I'm sure many of you are carrying things in your pocket or on your wrist that have Jable content in it. Uh, most of our customers uh, don't want, uh, don't really like to publicize how they produce their products, uh, so we kind of do the dirty work behind the scenes to ensure that you get the kind of quality and the kind of uh, products that you get. Um, we're, we're big, uh, not only in revenue, but uh, have close to 200,000 employees, uh, 15,000 CNC machines, uh, 4,000 molding machines, so we do things at a very large scale. Uh, the most noteworthy thing I can say about our scale is that uh, the summer that I joined the company a few years ago, we hired 30,000 people in six weeks for a single factory. So uh, you can imagine uh, you know, what kind of HR department you need to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, we cut across a wide range of industries. Uh, we have a lot of capabilities across uh, manufacturing disciplines. You know, our business is delivering products uh, globally, 100 factories. The thing actually that makes me most proud of the company is that uh, we've been on Fortune's uh, most admired company list the last three years. So imagine a, a contract manufacturing company being on a, a most admired company list, um, which is really kind of testament to the culture. Uh, I work uh, in our Blue Sky Center uh, in Silicon Valley. If any of you ever get out there, I'd welcome you to come by. It's, a, it's quite a destination. Uh, we have about 300 engineers there. Uh, we do uh, just a whole host of things in, uh, around the Internet of Things, around advanced manufacturing, 3D printing, robotics, automation, uh, our control tower, which is an end-to-end -end digital supply chain management uh, solution. Um, but what I want to talk about today is uh, is kind of additive manufacturing. Um, let me. Uh, um, um, I'll talk about our journey with uh, with Ultimaker because I think it's a good story and I think it's a story that uh, that uh, if you haven't gotten into additive manufacturing, I'd encourage you to uh, to take elements of our story and, and embody it and, and use it in, in your business. Um, our, our, we've been using 3D printing for, for many years. We, uh, we design specialty conformal cooling chambers around our molds so we can optimize cycle times. We've been using it for prototyping for, for you know, more than a decade. You know, and I think we're a pretty common user. Um, but about two and a half years ago, uh, my boss came to me and asked me to set up a group to focus on how do we drive this technology into manufacturing. Uh, so really kind of drive the use cases that can, that can deliver ultimately functional parts, but in the meantime, make us a much more efficient uh, manufacturer. So I'm gonna talk today about, um, about how we think about it for, uh, for manufacturing aids, our fixtures, our tooling, and our jigs, and I'll talk about the journey we went on with, uh, with Ultimaker. So um, when, I, uh, when I was handed the, uh, the keys to the, uh, to the additive manufacturing store at Jabel, I was also given a $3 million uh, uh, checkbook uh, to go buy some toys. So uh, I went out and bought all of the coolest gadgets I could find. All the top uh, uh, SLA machines, FDM machines, uh, 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 SLA, uh, SLS, um, uh, inkjet, you, know, you name it. I had a lab full of toys. And um, you know, what we, uh, as we started to bring those technologies up and start to get more familiar with it, uh, you know, we realized there was a tremendous amount of overhead with bringing those technologies up and becoming competent with it. So we took a step back and uh, we, uh, we also went out and bought half a dozen uh, Ultimakers. And uh, we did that uh, to just sprinkle them around our engineering lab. And so we handed them out to our, uh, to, we put them in a few strategic par parts of our uh, Blue Sky Center. 
and said, okay guys, a uh, new toy for you, uh, a new tool for you, uh, get to work. So um, uh, they did. Um, you know, I think this is, this is part of the journey. You know, they started to print things that were really useful, like their favorite uh, Pokemon characters, <laughs> uh, <coughs> animals, uh, movie, movie, games, uh, art. Who thought engineers would be uh, artists? Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, we didn't care. Because what we really wanted to do was to get a level of comfort and familiarity and adoption of the technology. Um, and so uh, that led to our first, uh, our first project. And you know, I call it, uh, how do you connect a square to a hole? Turns out that the square was the output from a, uh, from a router, and uh, the hole was the, uh, the, um, the exhaust uh, tube that took it out of the, uh, out of the area. And so uh, we said, so how do you connect that? Um, they, uh, uh, in CAD, you can do it real easily. Uh, and pretty soon, with a couple of uh, holes put in, we had, uh, we had a, a, a manifold. And it was the first use case that showed us that this technology was actually applicable in our business. And so from there, uh, we said, boy, we got a real good use case in uh, manufacturers. Take some of these printers and bring them downstairs to the labs and put them right alongside the engineers to do their, uh, their fixtures and their tooling. Um, and we, uh, we came up with a number of use cases that, uh, that really drove, um, drove a number of applications. Um, and you know, I think one good example is, um, uh, well, two I'll show you here. One is these, uh, these cable uh, hold downs that we had in one of our factories. We used to buy them in, uh, in groups of 20, 30, 40 at a time. Uh, 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 they were machined. We spent uh, $500 per order, and we were able through uh, through 3D printing to produce them at $15, so almost a 10x reduction in the cost of the uh, of the parts. And we took what was a lead time of, of a week and took it down to a day. Um, we uh, we also had an application uh, with uh, with solder uh, um, solder uh, covers for our uh, SMT devices. Again, uh, we were buying these in, uh, uh, at $10, but we had to buy 20 at a shot. Uh, we were able to cut the cost in half. And again, we cut the lead time from days down to hours. And so what that process allowed us to do was be able to go through the engineering routine at a much faster, uh, at a much faster pace and many more iterations. And that really drove us into a much more flexible uh, manufacturing process. Now, as, uh, as John talked about, um, you know, when, when we started with, uh, with a lot of the industrial printers, um, so we had a use, so we had, well, let me back up. We had use cases now. Uh, now we had to figure out, you know, how do you scale the stuff? And, you know, really what kind of interested us in the desktop printers is when we were buying the, the 100,000 or multi-100,000 dollar printers, uh, the output was at, at a level that, uh, and the cost of depreciating the equipment and the materials was just an economic model that didn't make sense. And, and, and we couldn't see from a, from a capital standpoint how we could scale that across our business. And so what really interested us in the, uh, the Ultimaker solution was low cost, upfront cost, uh, reasonable performance, uh, and an open platform that would allow us to be able to, to drive efficiencies out of the technology and allow us to get to cost models that we could scale in our factories. So um, uh, we then said, okay, the best way, you know, if we're gonna do this at scale, we gotta have a solution that can, that, can be, that can be scaled up, that can be done at an efficient level. Clearly the first step is you gotta put it into racks, and you gotta put it into a space efficient area where you can get, you can get a, uh, a level of output that can be, that can be reasonable. So what is, a, uh, what is an industrial print rack? Um, uh, first thing is uh, um, it's, industrial, it's industrialized uh, drawers. So this allows us to really easily uh, move, the, uh, move the printers in and out. If you have a problem, you can take a printer out and replace it. Uh, easy access to all of, the, uh, all of the materials and spool changes. And again, what we're trying to do is how do you get to a level of efficiency on your floor so that you can expect to run these things uh, uh, at, uh, at an around-the-clock operation. 
Um, the second thing is uh, environmental printing chambers. So you know, if we can isolate, if we can isolate the uh, um, the the printer bed, uh, we can get better quality. We can get better consistency. We can start to print different materials that may have outgassing, and that allows us to get to uh, to get to uh, um, more industrialized solutions. Uh, third is uh, supporting industrial safety standards. We get factories all over the world. Um, Granted, a bunch of them are in China, and I can't say they all comply with the same safety standards, but we like to think they do. Uh, so we, uh, we added uh, 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 emergency stop circuitry to these to allow us to be able to think about this as a, uh, as a production piece of equipment, obviously accessibility and serviceability. And then we, uh, we, uh, we leveraged some of the work that, uh, that uh, Ultimaker done and extended it uh, on the software side to really build um, uh, a really robust uh, print server and collaboration software platform that allowed us to be able to put every printer on a network and make that network available to, uh, to any engineer uh, across, our, across our organization. So, uh, and what this meant was now we could share files, we could share prints, we could share engineering, uh, not only at a work cell level, but at a factory level and even uh, across factories. And, and what this allows us to do is get to a level of collaboration with our engineers that uh, um, has made us much more efficient. And so, you know, as we kind of went through this journey, started at the, uh, started at the very front end with, uh, um, uh, with, with just putting it on desktops and letting engineers uh, experiment with it to finding use cases and fixtures and tooling uh, and manufacturing aids, which has proven to be substantially cheaper uh, and uh, fractions of the lead time uh, to building uh, and deploying racks of printers that are all interconnected and, and all shared that allow us to get to a level of efficiency that takes desktop costs uh, and accessibility and moves it into industrial uh, factory applications. And, and, and that's that's a solution. You know, we look at a rack like this, and we can deploy this for half the cost or a third the cost of an industrial printing solution, and we can get uh, five to ten x the output. You know, which is a massive difference in terms of being able to start using this across the organization. Uh, I had told our executive management that we ought to go buy. Uh, John likes this. Uh, you know, five hundred of these or a thousand of these, and just sort of spread them across our company. Because you know, really, the, the journey isn't about isn't about the um, the tools. The journey is about the thinking, and uh, we've got some great examples. Um, I don't have them here, of how our engineers went through a very traditional approach to uh, to to design to designing for additive manufacturing, and, and it's really funny because the first fixture we were making, we had a footwear project, and the first fixture that we made for this uh, footwear assembly. Was, uh, was a 3D printed solution uh, on an FDM machine that was uh, two inches thick by, uh, by about uh, 12 inches by 10 inches. And, and then it had slots in it for, for, the, uh, for the shoes. And um, you would have thought if you looked at it and uh, had painted it silver, that somebody had machined this thing out of a block of metal, because that's what it looked like. But with each iteration, our engineers figured out that, hey, we don't have to follow the same design principles we use for traditional manufacturing. Each iteration had less and less material because we finally realized that if you break the design down and you think about how you add material where you need it as opposed to taking it away, you can end up with incredibly efficient design so that the final set of fixturing was a, like a 10-piece uh, assembly with each little tiny module that could be iterated many times in a day to iterate the areas that needed iteration. And that allowed us to really take advantage of the tool as uh, for what it is, which is really an efficiency gain. So um, any event, that's, uh, uh, that's our journey. Uh, again, uh, we appreciate the support we've gotten from Ultimaker. Uh, we've uh, rolled this out across a number of our factories. And uh, you know, I believe that uh, you know, if you look out over the next, uh, over the next five years, you know, the vast majority of our fixtures and jigs and tooling, which is, you know, the $20 billion company, it's a massive scale, uh, will, be, uh, will be 3D printed.